the CES meeting. It's October 4th. Uh, Jasvir joins us. Welcome, Jasvir. And with uh, and the, with this particular group of folks, it seems like the best topic to start with is uh, like a synchronous callable boundary uh, between um, between uh, isolated realms in uh, yeah, in a web con in various web contexts. And uh, Matthew, Jazz, please take it away. Oh, and right, of course, we have a second topic. If that runs out, uh, we're uh, we wanted to discuss. Uh, stack filtering. Um, yeah, so I can, I guess I will, uh, I will summarize the idea floated around uh, recently. Um, so there is a concern on the web where code can create through different means, uh, same origin frames. And those same origin frames give synchronous access to the object graph of that frame. Uh, and so they can go and grab potentially capabilities uh, that would have been removed from the current realm. They can just go grab the capabilities from that new realm and apply them uh, to the current realm to escape any uh, modifications that were made. Uh, you, say, you say people are concerned about this. Who's concerned about this? This is what, for example, uh, Snow does that um, uh, Gal at Minamask uh, has been working on. Uh, I believe Jazz has a uh, consults for a tool uh, that does something similar. Uh, Jay Scrambler, uh, from what I understand. It's basically oh, any security tool that does modifications to the current realm and uh, to hide some capabilities or attenuate them uh, also needs to be conscious that code may be able to create another realm, uh, same origin realm, to grab those capabilities back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the, the reason I'm asking is just what code is the, you know, who is, who is it that's concerned about trying to remove things from a realm in order to deny authority. Certainly Snow is. Is Snow the audience we're talking about? Snow is one case and any users of Snow, because Snow is, Snow is a library. Uh, yes. And I believe Jazz can talk more about uh, his use cases. So I, I, I would characterize, so I do have a set of use cases that are similar to Snow, but but my motivation for this, the reason I got excited about this idea is different. Um, in order to decompose an application into, um, in order to decompose an application into its pieces, if you put a if you put a part of an application uh, into a separate isolate, uh, at the moment you necessarily have to turn code that was previously synchronous into asynchronous code, and that is a that is a very aggressive transformation that one needs to carry out. Um, what, I, what I liked about this idea is that it reduces the amount of work that one needs to do because um, ba ba barring callbacks, uh, the, the, the transformation is much less aggressive. And so it is easier to identify portions of an application that one can, of, of a legacy application that one can uh, transform so that uh, parts of the application are now isolated. That that was that is my core motivation for being excited. N not the not the uh, yeah. That, that, full stop. I okay. Um, so so the, the initial concern that Snow was having was. Um, preventing access to capabilities from same origin realms with which have full direct access uh, to, to the object draft of that realm. Um, and my, my initial suggestion was to have a header or other kind of uh, knob on the web uh, for a top origin realm, a top window to be able to say, any realms, same origin realms created uh, 
sub 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 window created like this, you do not get direct access to the object graph. Uh, the only thing you get access to is, and I at first I started with you only get asynchronous access through post message. Um, of course, the ergonomic of post message are uh, are difficult because it's an asynchronous uh, communication channel. Um, so I suggested that it may be possible to build a uh, something similar to the callable boundary, but using uh, structured cloning, which is a web feature, uh, to enable communications between same origin realms, synchronous communication between same origin realms. Uh, so I have some questions. So we did a lot of work on um, on this the uh, the callable boundary, yes. and yes. Um, and you know shadow realms, uh, mm -hmm. and we just found out at the last TC thirty nine meeting during the the part that I missed. Uh, so maybe I got this not quite accurate, but that Salesforce is continuing forward uh, mm -hmm. with working with the Gaia. Does that mean shadow realms did not did not did not drop back from stage three? No, Shadow Realm is back at stage two. Oh, uh, it is. And Shadow Realm does overlap in some use cases. Um, okay. So the thing I, about the Shadow Realm called the boundary is that unlike structured clone, um, it was designed so that we could build a membrane on top of it, which Salesforce has, has done. Um, and so why not simply, given that the, given that we expect the browser to eventually support shadow realms, why not just allow shadow, the call the boundary between different origin shadow realms? Two reasons. Um, membranes are not simple. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, but using the membrane library that exists off the shelf that Salesforce created is simple. Yes. But it's not it's not compatible with what most developers are doing today. It is extremely mm -hmm. tedious to use. Uh, and so even it is sorry, it's extremely I missed the adjective. It's extremely what to use? It's very difficult to use. Uh, and even if you put a membrane on top, it might not fit the uh, the ergonomics of what developers are used to to communicate between realms today. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's but but with the membrane, it's extremely easy to use because it fits the ergonomics of how developers are used to communicating between objects. Yeah, but that's not native to the web. That's that's the problem. That, neither is neither is synchronous post message. Synchronous a synchronous call between realms would is a lot closer to what the web has today. Uh, it's a lot closer to what the web offers today. So it would be a lot easier to justify putting the callable boundary as the only uh, mechanism to interact between two full realms synchronously seems. I don't know. There's a lot, there's, there's a lot more object boundaries on the web today than there are um, uh, post message boundaries. I did not understand that. Uh, you, you, you're trying to make the, the point from familiarity from what's on the web today. Uh, web programmers do a lot more synchronous calls object to object than they do calls over post message between frames. So uh, given that Shadow Realms so, ha, support a high quality membrane and membrane libraries off the shelf at this point for any, um, that just turning right. this into Object to object calls between origins seems uh, bo both both mo the most familiar and the most straightforward. But that is not native. I think until the day we have a native membrane implementation in browsers or in JavaScript, I don't think we can. Because you're saying because it's a because it's a library rather than supported by the browser. I think that changes quite a bit the story. Yes. Why? Usually, the answer to this question is uh, page speed load, uh, time to load the page. So we're talking about time to load the 
mem the, 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 the near membrane library that Salesforce wrote. Is this a gargantuan library or is this tiny? I think it's tiny. Any library in general, you don't, you want to avoid um, the, it, that library, from what I understand also, because of the isolation between, uh, between realms, that library also uh, require complex build uh, infrastructure or uh, and I believe that's currently the case with that library, it requires actually unsafe eval to be enabled, which is unacceptable on the web for most properties. Like you need you need the membrane, you need both sides of the membrane to be executed on, on, on each side. That's either a complex build uh, infrastructure to set up, or you can rely, the membrane library that Salesforce has built currently relies on uh on evaluating a script on the other side which is which is unacceptable on the web and safety val is not okay okay so assuming that shadow realms does get into the browser that it sounds like the the it would be a uh, incremental step then to advocate direct browser support for the near membrane right we need we would need to follow up for a membrane, uh, for a native membrane implementation. Yep. Jeff? It seems a lot and, more attractive than synchronous structured clone. I hate structured clone. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm with you on, on that, Mark. This is why I made Matthew say the thing. I, I, I don't like the structured clone either. I, I don't, to yeah. be clear, I don't like it either, but it, it's what yeah, we but, have. But it is well, what we well, have. So, well, well, no, with, with, it's what we have is is object to object you know calls is we, we have we have you know orders of magnitude more object to object interaction than we have post message interaction oh and this is true but like so is is the is the is the shadow realm objects callable directly so if i if i have an object in a different realm from can, can I cross realm call an a function on an object? You don't have no. You don't have objects through the callable boundary. The only thing you have is wrapped functions. Oh, you, you but you do have wrap, and the membrane is responsible for wrapping and unwrapping. Yeah. So the callable boundary is basically a very, very, very lightweight membrane that only supports uh, functions. Uh, and primitive arguments. Yeah, okay, on top this is of that, the near, the, yeah, the near, on top of that, the near membrane library builds a um, you know a, a membrane that br brings about practical transparency, so that you can uh, act as if you have um, uh, direct object to object interaction across the callable boundary. But the callable boundary itself is only doing. Um, uh, functions and primitive data, and then and and monkey patching of primitive. Like if I monkey patch an array on one side, I'm not expecting to have that on the other side. Arrays are not supported. It's an object. Array, Wait, what? Uh, you cannot pass an array through the call boundary. boundary. Are you asking oh. about the call boundary, or are you asking about the near the near membrane? I, so unfortunately, I, I need to go and do some reading. This is new to me. So I I, I guess I'm asking about both. The callable boundary is uh, is the interface between a shadow realm between two shadow realms or a shadow realm and the normal uh, legacy realm. Um, the only thing it allows through is wrapped functions or primitives, both as arguments oh. and return values. That means what, that what is a primitive? A primitive is a number, a string, uh, a boolean, uh, a big int, uh, a symbol. Um, not null and undefined. Yeah. Yeah. Null undefined. Yeah. Null and undefined are allowed through. Um, basically, no objects, no, uh, no non-callable objects 
if the object is callable, the only thing that appears on the other side is a new function from the other realm that just invokes the function uh, from that was originally passed, applying this, the, the restrictions of the callable boundary, which is only allowing primitives or functions as arguments and wrapping uh, as arguments and, and a return value similarly, only allowing uh, primitives or wrap functions. Yeah, Here's one way to think about the call of the boundary, my favorite way to think about the call of the boundary is that um, uh, it's a separation of concerns in constructing membrane. That the real point from my point of view is to construct the membrane on top of this. The problem with membrane code is that you have to carefully audit membrane code to ensure that it never leaks a direct object reference from one side to the other. By building a half membrane on each side of the callable boundary, the callable boundary is a simpler mechanism that enforces that the object graphs cannot be mixed, that the object graphs stay separated. No direct object references can leak from one side to the other. And therefore, when you build half membranes on each side to bring about overall a membrane between the two sides, uh, even if your membrane code is buggy, it still cannot leak an object reference between the two sides. But 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 functions can be passed across this boundary. No, yes. only by that's the the they get auto wrapped by the boundary. But uh, so if I close over if if a if I've closed over a a object on one side of the boundary, what happens to that? You well, you simply you get a, a wrapper of the function on the other side. When you call the wrapper function, it then goes through the call boundary to call the original function. But, but only so after, is, sorry, go ahead. You but only have, after censoring all of the arguments and return values according to the rules. So, of the so, there, is, they, they, so there is a connection between the, the between the two realms. There yes. are references between the two. Okay. Right. There, okay. But there's no, there's no direct, uh, there's no single object reference that can leak across the boundary. What's happening is call, callability leaks across the boundary on part, I mean, not leaks across the boundary, it's passed across the boundary by passing functions that get wrapped. But then when you call them with arguments, the arguments then are, um, uh, uh, in, you know, uh, the call boundary, the, the wrapper, enforces that the arguments can only be primitive values and other functions uh, and and also enforces that the return result coming the other way likewise so these wrap oh, yeah. the, the function wrappers enforce that it, when they call across the boundary that you can't be passing anything other than data and other similarly wrapped functions so if i return a value i, I return an array that I closed over on one side when I pass it across. What what, so you, what you is get, the expectation that the membrane you is going to return? return array. You, you cannot return an array. It's a, it's an error to return an array. Uh, Just what, like it's an error to return an object. An object. You can what you can do is return a function that closes over those objects, and when called, it obviously has access to that as part of the yeah. Uh, but 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 that function, if it returns an array, I I understand what you're saying, but if that function returns an array, the membrane no. is going to say no die. Yeah. No, no, no. no, 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 no. Hold, hold on. We got, we have to distinguish the two levels. If we're at the callable boundary and the called function returns an array, that's an error. If we're out, if we're um, going through the membrane, then the membrane returning an array um, that gets you know proper that gets properly emulated. With I'm not sure exactly what what the, this particular I think this particular thing might I'm not sure what they do for arrays but for objects you, you get a proxy on the other side in normal membrane fashion um, uh, so you know if if a function on one side of a membrane returns an object to the other side of the membrane what the other side of the membrane produces is a proxy um, but the but those but those but each membrane half is is has to communicate to the other membrane half through the call of boundary. 
is is uh do you think that browser makers are excited about this proposal the proposal did reach stage three in tc39 the browser makers then got stuck trying to figure out how to do uh html integration with it uh there was um uh, due to frustration at that and the fact that there was no agreed HTML integration ready by the time TC39 last convened, uh, it dropped back to stage two. We were concerned that it would just kind of die on the vine through lack of effort because Salesforce had been the major force pushing it and they were they seemed to not be taking it past the this further required effort to deal with W3C and HTML integration standards. Uh, they've now said that they will be proceeding to do that. So yes, I expect it to reach stage three again. I expect it to be implemented. I don't care whether the browser makers are excited about it or not, as long as they do it. Okay. <laughs> so, when I say excited, I mean, is it likely that they will do it? I think it's likely that they will do it. To clarify, the complication of uh, the HTML integration is that the realm that is being created is not a full realm like uh, the ones that are associated to uh, Windows. Uh, it is more of yeah. a sub-realm of, uh, of the current window, which means it delegates a bunch of uh, capabilities to the main window and the complexity is in making sure that those um, those implementation that implementation doesn't leak uh, anything from it doesn't leak through realms. The idea of a shadow realm is to be something isolated from the main realm, as in the object graph, and uh, and and so the the main implementation complexity is making sure nothing in the web spec will return erroneously an object from the main realm. This is something which has puzzled me, which is why is HTML integration even a thing? Because I think of these, these shadow realms as sort of, I think, I think of them as headless realms. They, they, they don't have the HTML so, stuff. So it's like, what, what, why is this even a thing? There is, and that, that's the thing. Um, so in general, we don't want developers to understand whether a certain API is a JavaScript API or whether it is a host hold, API. Hold, hold on, hold on. Don't say we. Do I, not include in me general, in that. In general, the committee, the TC39 committee as a whole has wanted to avoid. Uh, no, that is not true. They cannot agree to avoid. They cannot, I'm sorry, they cannot agree to not avoid. The, the, there, is, there is disagreement on this. And in order to make progress, we are, um, we, you know, uh, basically uh, Google, let's, let's, it's not browser makers, it's Google, it's, it's specifically, is insisting that, um, uh, that developers on the web not have to be aware of the difference between JavaScript and the browser. And because they're insisting on that, we cannot achieve consensus on anything that would make them aware. Yeah, the that, doesn't, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean we all we, we're we're all joyously wanting this 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 outcome. The status quo has been uh, to not impose the distinction uh, of APIs where APIs are defined on users, which means some APIs defined currently defined in the web. Uh, would be exposed in Shadow Realms. The question is, which ones are these APIs? And some of those have more capabilities than others. So there's two questions at, at hand. It's like, how do how are browsers and, and HTML uh, spec supposed to decide which API should be exposed in Shadow Realm and which, which one shouldn't? And for the ones that are exposed, how to properly uh, isolate them uh, in, in, in the way they're specified? And just so that Dan Miner, who's on the call and representing Mozilla, is aware that he has been heard, 
Mozilla's position, I believe, was that they were indifferent as to whether host APIs uh, were presented in the shadow realm. Um, correct me. Yeah. yeah, that's correct. But the um, the other two large implementers are in agreement that yes, we need to have the HTML integration. So Google yeah. and Apple both spoke out against just having shadow realms without the host hook. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I, I personally am sympathetic to that stance. There are some things that would be like having it, it would be an undue burden on some applications to have to run the fetch API, for example, through a near membrane. But, but the DOM is not going to be ambiently available to a shareholder, right. surely. The DOM is not meant to be exposed. Uh, well, that's okay. good. No, no, no. I, I will take back my comment about fetch. I'm not even sure that fetch is on the table for being in a shadow realm. I, I actually believe it should be. Uh, it should be directly exposed because the burden of putting fetch through a, a membrane is is too high. Damn. Because so, membranes are not native yet. Which is to say, as uh, to reinforce Mark's point. There is no agreement, and it is unlikely that, 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 that all people will be satisfied by any outcome. <laughs> but it is, it is, I agree also with Mark that it is likely that it will be implemented. Um, if I can just follow up to that point, I mean, that was basically. I think the decision that was made at the last committee meeting was that, you know, the only thing holding this back was like, you know, a list of suitable APIs to be exposed and there, there's no intention to, you know, try to redesign APIs or anything like that. It's just like making sure we have a list of web APIs to be exposed and sufficient tests that we can make sure that they're working as intended. Yeah, and the and the point in the the point on which a lot of this hinged in the design of the spec for Shadow Realm was that we required that all properties on the global object of a Shadow Realm be configurable, such that a mechanism could remove capabilities. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Um, there does remain some um, integration points that are not fully uh, ironed out, in particular around unhandled uh, errors and unhandled uh, promise rejections, uncaught errors and unhandled promise rejections. Um, it is clear uh whether a shadow realm should be able to somehow uh and how it would be able to catch some unhandled rejections in particular that that's actually something that that is not possible today or and and if those are not captured if they should bubble uh back to the main, main realm um it's similar problems to how an Cutter and unhandled rejections are handled in workers. Uh, for example, unhandled rejections do not uh, propagate back to the main uh, to, to the worker creator because that would because there is nothing to report. You would have to say like, hey, this is this promise object that got rejected, which obviously is not passable around workers. So it's a similar issue here. The, the biggest unknown there is if an unhandled rejection happens in a shadow realm, how can tooling in the main realm report those and handle those? So I like I like this mapping to the uh, uh, issue of workers. I hadn't heard of that before. So what right now, when an unhandled rejection happens in a worker, how does the programmer receive a diagnostic? A unhandled uh, rejection event uh, in the worker itself. If it's not handled in the worker, uh, that's it. Does the programmers never get a diagnostic? 
oh, it's shown on the control, but that's about it. <laughs> uh, so why is no, that not they do not. Hmm? Not even? They, they, they do not get, I mean, it's just show, shown in the console. The, yeah. the color does not, the, I okay. mean, you said the programmer, but the calling program does not get a, does not get an event. Okay, so, 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 um, so the real issue is the console is, having there be a console available in the shadow realm to log these diagnostics too. And then the question about where the console app goes. Yeah, it doesn't I, do it. I, I, I'm, yeah, I think that this is a mistake we should not replicate. Like, I think that they made a mistake there and it's unfortunate that that mistake exists. It, there is, that's a problem. There is literally no other way to do it right now because the unhandled rejection events gives you a reference to the error object, but also to the promise. The error object could be wrapped and recreated. That's not really an issue. The problem is the promise. You need you need a stable identity for the promise so that like when you have a handled uh, case and, and potentially also being able to handle it directly by adding a region, by adding a handler to that promise. Um, what does, any, does anybody do anything with these um, uh, unhandled rejection handlers other than emit diagnostics? Any, I mean, emitting diagnostics, any any telemetry framework will hook into those. Some of those, okay. some, there are also some users where basically they're just going to like go and handle right away. <laughs> like on Node, I have seen code that does like, I have an unhandled rejection, let me handle it and do nothing. And let's not forget the horror that was domains, which the large point of domains was so that you could attach an unhandled exception handler. I don't, I don't think, uh, I don't know if they did anything with rejection on the domain boundary. It's too old, but uh, yeah, it was. Funny enough, the unhandled rejection stuff is also the biggest complication for us in context uh, because when you have an unhandled rejection, hmm. that means you didn't have a then. Uh, so the question of which async, async context uh -huh. uh, used for the unhandled rejection event is is a is a complication. Interesting. The whole unhandled rejection stuff is just a big mess all, all, all throughout. Yeah. Um, for the record. My position on unhandled rejection is that that was a mistake. There is no such thing as a rejection that might not be later handled and that this should have been surfaced with a console API of like, hey, this is currently unhandled and then now it is handled. Please make that message disappear from the console. <laughs> I mean, this is effectively what's going on with uh, with these events it's it's it is an handled currently and then later it is handled uh, and then it's on on the program to, to react to that. The yeah. problem is that I, I think the biggest problem is that those events rely on the direct uh, access to the promise objects. Well, okay. so, so, so the root of the problem in this particular case is that the unhandled rejection API first appeared in Node. And in Node, making a message disappear from the console as if the console were a debugging console is not a thing. Uh, so, whereas if this if, whereas if this had been born on the web, and I will note that Q did have hooks for an extension that would do this, <laughs> this the 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 browser debugger is in a position to not only show you unhandled rejections but also pe unsettled pending promises, and we, we could have a much richer debug experience around promises, but we don't. Well, because... I mean, still, still could, but it's it's kind of immaterial. Unhandled rejections did make it in, and we yes. now do have to, yes, endure the corresponding complications. I, I, this is an aside, but since you brought it up, Chris, I I feel permission to bring this up. Do you think that a hookable console is? Uh, a feature that would be valuable and a good idea in general, or oh, this is this is a hook this is cheating. Hook. Yeah, so like on message on the console. No, I I don't have a strong feeling. I know that. Um, well, it 
it can be, I'm, I'm just going to say it can be on the console object itself because the console object currently is only a sync and doesn't, uh, doesn't give you any reading capabilities. Uh, I, that should not change. I agree. That should not change. That should not change. Right. The console should be a one. If you have such right. an ability, you should. I actually somewhat like Node's approach of being able to create a new console object, providing your own streams uh, of where the console will log into. I, I, um, I've abused uh, on CSP violation to do all kinds of crazy things. But one of the things that occurs is that I cannot remove messages from the from from the browser console and it's always made me sad because customers would tell me oh there's all these you know unnecessary errors and it's like no don't worry those those are not real errors but but i i i'm not able to control what messages show up on on that console uh but you know the crazy things you can do on error is is kind of nice yeah, I, I I think that that is with having an API on console for dismissing a message um, is consistent with the requirement that it be a write-only sync. There's console.clear also on the web does exist. So you can clear everything. <laughs> yeah, but then I don't want to clear everything. I just want to clear the shit that like I caused that I have handled. You, you could you could imagine a, an API that says start session and then clear session. Uh, if you could just remove a, a section of it, you don't need automatically read access. You can just like have this clear uh, clear section basically. Oh my God, that is genius. I don't know whether the CSP violations would show up inside session, but that is a that is certainly something I'm going to be testing out. That is genius. Okay. You mean like the, the collapsible thing? Because we do that too. And, and uh, allow me to introduce Eli. Eli uh, works on free gap and transcend. Yeah, we also made our own little custom logging library for it because we didn't like browser logs. I mean, the default style. Um, uh, if you don't mind, could I like, since you know my schedule is kind of bad, uh, could I just get a quick little summary of like what I missed? Because I know you had that big uh, proposal, and I just I just wanted to hear more about like you know how it's going. Oh, I'll make sure to post the recording for one so that you can get it in, at length. Um, oh, cool. That'll that'll be on the agenda attached to this meeting. Yeah. Thank well, you. We we originally started a discussion about uh, preventing synchronous access. Uh, no, sorry, preventing direct object graph access to same origin uh, realms. In the in particular, like so, same origin iframes or uh, same origin pop-ups, um, and we went to the DX question that. Uh, a post message asynchronous only interaction between those same origin realms might be too onerous for a lot of use cases. Um, however, we explored that potentially something uh, like the callable boundary, but with structured cloning might be an option. Mark mentioned that structured cloning, well, nobody here really likes structured cloning and questioned why the callable boundary, callable boundary itself was not sufficient. Uh, which raised the question of exploring shadow realm and the callable boundary. Uh, but at the end of the day, the biggest issue is the callable boundary on its own is not uh, ergonomic without a membrane on top of it. And there is no native membrane in the web or uh, in TC39 yet, I guess. Um, Got it. And you guys are just trying to figure out the most ideal shape for like the membranes contract, essentially. Yeah, and there's there then and um, Salesforce has created a membrane that they're around the call of boundary called the near membrane. Uh, that's um, a very clear idea, and that they're using. They've done a lot of engineering on it. They're using it in production. It's open source and it's off the shelf. So so you know the the issue is. Um, uh, shyness about using an off-the-shelf library as opposed to something native to the browser. 
Um, and there's the, 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 the one, I think altogether, I didn't understand all the reasons for that shyness. It seems like people use stock off the shelf libraries to make things ergonomic all the time. Um, there was the CSP issue of requiring evaluation. Right. Part of that, I didn't get. I didn't get any of the other objection. No, there, I mean, yeah, there is a CSP CSP issue. Require requiring on safety ball is a non-starter uh, for most. I got that part. Web applications. The alternative is to somehow have the membrane uh, bundled correctly in the scripts or in the in whatever is loaded uh in the other frame uh which is also which, which is a bundling concern it also requires you to control uh both sides uh so when we're saying same origin that doesn't mean it's part of the same uh build process uh so there is all those complications about if you don't have native communication like if you don't have a a, uh, okay, I think I was misunderstanding you earlier then. Let me make sure I'm understanding you now. It's not that the near membrane itself needs eval in order to do its job, which which was surprising. Currently it does. Currently it, does. it does. Yes. Conceptual as implemented, my understanding is that it does because that's that's just a uh that's not just not a concern that uh, Salesforce has. Uh, conceptually, I don't believe it has to. However, uh, there has to be a way for the membrane code to be loaded on both sides of the membrane. And currently, the near membrane is leveraging uh, a, 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 a script evaluation uh, that is provided by Shadow Realm. You would need something else such as a build step that correctly sets up the membrane uh, on both sides and okay. that is complex to to do with build tooling which is to okay. say it isn't just a dependency on the uh, that the platform needs to opt into it is an, a dependency that all of their plugins would have to and train as well it's very similar to our relationship at agoric with eventual send both sides have to entrain all of the weight of eventual send in order to communicate across to use that membrane to communicate across any particular boundary. All right, um, we're at seven minutes from the hour. We usually like to stop at uh, five minutes to the hour so folks have a chance to, uh, to move to their next meeting. Um, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I think think uh, that means that Matthew's topic of stack filtering will follow uh, will will flow into next week's agenda um and that with Mark before then <laughs> yeah yeah most likely most likely all right see uh, I'm going to stop the recording thank you okay thank you